shackled and manacled in my native land, beaten sore and bleeding by strangers carrying metallic noisy sticks that kill at will. I stumble, goaded by lashes, a walking monument of denial and pain, my thoughts reeling. Alone in a crowd of similar souls in bondage, of similar fate we are herded like sheep to that lonely narrow door of hopelessness. Was I born to disappear, beaten, cowed and chained all the way to the belly of a monstrous sheep never to see my motherland again? I am the unlucky, born to be beaten to slavery, abandoned by fate, destined to be mourned by history, cursed to live a ceaselessly laborious, cheerless life. As I cross the door, I become a walking dead, for my very essence remains on the African soil before the point of no return and the voyage of death. Point of no return signifies usually unwilling of a given experience about to be pushed into oblivion by circumstances one can't help. If it is sought for perhaps the pain of dislocation will mute into a fugitive sadness at the known that is lost forever. But when it is forced and under brutal denial and restrictions, the excruciating pain Panic and sense of loss can in many ways be more reprehensible than clear and approaching death. That was the lot of the slave that was chained and whipped into line and force fed into the bowels of an alien implacable vessel, cavernous and dirty, indifferent to the human cargo it was destined to carry in misery to a life of abject horror in faraway lands. With xenophobic and devilish masters who seemed well schooled in brutality. Such was the lot of the slave that left the shores of sub Saharan Africa. That final nightmare, made indelible by brutal lashes and painful manacles on hands, feet, and neck, was the dubious lullaby of separation from the motherland and from memories of distraught relatives, if any survived the slave raid. Such was the unspeakable nightmare that point of no return must hold for the unfortunate souls, born free but forced to a fate of slavery through man's inhumanity to man. On our concluding episodes on the Badagri experience, which at once ushered in both our Shunt of Free Beach Comber series and the Slave series, we were moving into Berefu Island, otherwise known as the point of no return in Badagri slave history experience. Stay with us as the drama unfolds on Shantafrik, Tourism Without Boundaries. Before delving deeper into the point of no return theme on our presentation today, let's look again at what a slave really means and why slavery existed in the first place. Now slavery, in my understanding, is an aberration of humanity. The, the essential reason being that a human being essentially is born to be free. And when someone becomes a slave, in simple terms, it means the person is owned like an animal, is often treated less than an animal, and does work round the clock without pay. 
that in, in, in itself is uh, inconsistent with any conceivable perception of appropriate treatment that should be meted out to human beings. That's what is, you know, the unacceptable about slavery. There are several offered definitions. None of them capture the monstrous, atrocious, negative aspect of slavery. They just define it in acceptable terms. For instance, a slave is a person who is the legal property of another and is forced to obey them, rather than in of course definition of slavery. Another says a slave is one who is owned as the property of someone else, especially in involuntary servitude. Good English. It doesn't talk about how horrible it is. Even yet, we have a slave as someone who is legally owned by another person and is forced to work for that person without pay. <laughs> None of these definitions talk about the starvation, the maltreatment, the beating, the reduction of a human being to a state less than that of an animal. Slavery was an aberration of humanity. That an unforgivable thing for anyone to do to another person. It will be wrong to begin to think that slavery is restricted, as it were, to only Africans or sub Saharan Africans. In actual fact, history records will show you that the Arabs started slavery even before the Europeans did, and they even took Europeans as slaves. This is very clear. And, uh, and the records about these exist. But uh, we are talking about transatlantic slavery as it affects Africa. <laughs> slavery at all in human activity and way of life. Does it not pander to greed, to laziness, to class consciousness, to the tendency for human beings to look down on others and reduce their own kind to a second class or third class status? Even now when you look at the hierarchy of human existence and the way humans interact. There is a tendency for people to have a class distinction. Some people feel, shall we say, more entitled to life and its privileges than others. Some people are by birth or circumstances more affluent than others. And there is a curious psychology, you'll find out, that um, people interpret privilege with, shall we say, an affected kind of laziness. In other words, that's why you have the concept of house boys, that's why you have house girls. Even in African society, people that are titled or wealthy or shall we say can afford it, tended to acquire personnel to do the menial jobs. When I say menial jobs, jobs like cultivating the farm, cleaning up, washing, cooking. In some cases, even people that do military, military, military activity for any particular community environment they find themselves because of the risk element. So someone is acquired as a slave, trained and forced to do this thing. And of course the person is to that extent extendable, the expendable I mean that is if the person loses his life or her life or dies in the process, it's uh, is acceptable to the owner. So in, in the context, in the African context, this whole thing is more of the movement, really, of the Puritans out of Europe into, you know, the New England, which is, of course, the United States of America, it all started with the Portuguese Henry, the navigator, who started moving around the world. 
According to historical records, the English aristocrats were forbidden to walk by honor, whatever that means. So they started to import African slaves in Jamestown around 1609. The English in New England were Puritans whose whole life was based on work, so they didn't need them. The British government also transported criminals to America to work as slaves as punishment. That wasn't as permanent enough, except for the Irish who also underwent a lot of slavery, even from their own kind. Does this really justify slavery? I recognize that in the Bible really, there are talk about slaves, but as a subject for another time. The question now is, was there slavery in Africa prior to the slave trade as brought by the white man? Slavery did indeed exist in Africa, but it was not the same type of slavery that the Europeans introduced in the transatlantic slave trade. It was not as commercialized and certainly was not on the same scale. Slaves within Africa lost the protection of their families and their place in society. But they or their children, however, might eventually become part of their master's family. In some cases, within three generations or even less, there were no social distinctions between people of slave origins and those of free origins. This is very different to the system of chattel slavery, subhuman slavery, which Europeans introduced in this system. The status of the slave was passed down through the generations. Once a person was enslaved, their children and progeny would invariably remain slaves for their entire lives. What a fate and future to look forward to. This was not usually the case with slaves within Africa. The treatment of slaves within Africa varied considerably. Otoba Kugwano, a freed slave, remembered slaves as being well fed and treated relatively well. And Olauda Ekweano of Igbo extraction, another freed slave, noted in his memoirs that slaves might even own slaves themselves, while some slaves worked in government administration. Others were agricultural laborers and many died in the gold and salt mines of West Africa. Africans usually enslaved other African people, not their own particular ethnic or cultural group. Slaves were taken as prisoners of war or enslaved in payment for debt or as punishment for crime. These slaves supplied the slave trade to North Africa. They also occupied and supplied the oriental slave trade from East Africa to areas such as India. But as the demand for slaves grew from Europeans, warfare and raids to get more and more slaves and the kidnapping of individuals increased, all driven, of course, by avarice and greed. The slave trade across the Sahara Desert to the north or to North Africa began in the 7th century AD. The slaves were sold to traders in such now modern countries as Morocco, Libya and Egypt and to the North African empires in the Mediterranean and Southern Europe. People in these areas wanted female slaves for domestic servants and male slaves to serve as soldiers, guards and in administrative posts. Slaves were at first bought and kidnapped from Europe as well as Sub-Saharan Africa. But Africa became the main source, rather unfortunately. It is indeed estimated that in the 17th century, a period of relatively heavy slave trading, about 10,000 enslaved Africans a year were traded north from West Africa. This slave trade with North Africa and its empire expanded into the 19th century. And at the same time, slave trading was being abolished by most Western European countries thanks to the exhortations of people like William Wilberforce and Granville Sharp.
It is important to state that not all tribes in pre-colonial Africa willingly accepted or actively participated in slavery and slave trade, at least with the white slave trade raiders for whatever rather trivial advantage. Like all things in life, there are always exceptions and history does record several spirited and even successful uprisings against the Europeans and Arabs by angry natives. There are special mention and note, however, are the Kru people who are indigenous to Liberia and Ivory Coast, now known as Cote d'Ivoire. These resilient defined people were mostly known for seafaring and their strong resistance to capture by the European enslavers in the transatlantic slave trade. The crew would fight vehemently and even take their own lives for surrendering to enslavement. Because of their tenacity, they were labelled as difficult and therefore less valuable as both slaves and human merchandise in the slave trade. Now, apart from their strength in resistance, the crew people were known for their ability to effortlessly navigate the seas. This skill in both canoeing and surfing the strong, untamed ocean currents brought upon such recognition, which later afforded them work on British merchant and warships in the 1700s. These remarkable people account for 7% of the Liberian population. Christopher Columbus, for instance, went into what he thought was India, which turned out to be the West, and tried to corrupt the native Indians into menial work. Of course, he resisted it. He killed off quite a lot of them. This also was reminisc is reminiscent of the Red Indians in America, the native Indians, who resisted slavery and simply would not accept it, which was why they were not really used as much as black Africans were. So slavery became a greed-driven need that enforced complacency and, and laziness among the well-to-do. History records will show you that British aristocrats by honor, so to speak, <laughs> were not expected to work. Somebody had to do the job. They acquired habits from exploration, not just Britain, Portugal, Spain, France. You know, something like tobacco came from America, from the Red Indians. Somebody had to cultivate that tobacco. Now, in plantations like Barbados, where they do rum that came from sugar cane, sugar cane provided sugar, they developed habits of drinking tea and coffee, they found out that drinking tea on its own was a, a little bit bitter, you know, it's just like drinking Lipton, it's bitter, and sugar sweetened it. And so they needed people to go in the tropics there in those islands and cultivate these things and then have them produced and shipped back for their consumption. So I think it's the quasi perception of aristocratic opportunity and privilege that you don't have to work. It's affecting a lot of us these days where a lot of young people go to school, come out, and then um, they'd rather go for, a, I mean, a white collar job, which means sitting around in an office like I'm sitting, and sometimes pushing files up and down. Whereas someone could be very active in the farm, somebody could set up a shop, somebody could get into something like art, music, football, etc., and thereby gain a means of sustenance. But once you graduate, our perception, perhaps, <laughs> what we borrowed from the colonial orientation, is that you're elevated above anything menial, anything that has no handwork. It has to be, you have to be sad. The same concept of you have a driver. You can drive, <laughs> but you need a driver. So I think it's just a carry through of that tendency for people to look for people that they supposedly look at second class or third class to end up doing the jobs they feel that they are not. And meant to do. They are elevated above doing, they are above doing some of these things. Including this episode, I hope you appreciated the import, the emphasis of the point of no return or door of no return as it were. It is an English idiom that says that a word is enough for the wise. 
the Nigerian version of it is proverbial and states that when you speak to the wise and diligent, they take notice and act as expected. But if you speak to a dunce or foolish fellow, he tends to fling himself head and all into the bush. Slavery in all its ramifications, nuances and presentations remain totally unacceptable and should not be tolerated. Hence the collective African position to which should, should be and remain never again. Finally, our Nigerian people say that if one does not know where the rain starts to fall on him, he can hardly be expected to know when it's dried upon his body. Hence the need for vigilance to ensure no form of slavery, no matter how innocuous it might seem, should visit African people in general again. See you again next week, same time, for yet another exciting, informative edition of Shunt of Freak Discovery Series. You know, tourism without boundaries.